The gospel will serve as the basis for the sermon this evening. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, do you know what a paradox is? The dictionary tells us that it's someone or something or, or a statement or a situation that has seemingly contradictory qualities or, or phrases or, or, or just something that just doesn't seem to make total sense. For example, a, a paradox would be saying that the more I increase my knowledge, the more I realize I don't know so much. Or here's another one. It would be saying that it's actually more tiring to stand than it is to walk. Simon and Garfunkel once sang about the sound of silence. I mean, that's a paradox. It just, it seems like a contradiction. It doesn't seem to make sense. But there's a key word there, seems. You see, the Christian faith is actually full of paradoxes. Start with the nature of God. Three persons, yet one God. The Trinity is a paradox. Jesus is true God and true man. He, he created all things, but he was born a baby who needed his mother's care. And then he died on a cross. That, that, that's a paradox. It, it doesn't just seem to compute. In dealing with the rather obnoxious request of two of Jesus' closest disciples. Jesus lays before us today the paradox of the Christian. And we'll see him presented to us in terms of both our eternal salvation and our daily lives. I imagine that Jesus at times felt like just beating his head against the wall when, when dealing with his disciples. Kind of like the, when you tell a child to, to hang up your backpack every day when you come home from school, but there it is every day right by the door on the floor. So here we have James and John, two brothers who along with Peter were Jesus' inner circle of disciples. I mean, they had seen Jesus. They were there when he raised a, a little girl, Jairus' daughter from the dead. They had been there on the mountain to witness his transfiguration. And of course, they, along with the rest of the disciples, had heard Jesus teach for over two years. And now here they come. And actually, Matthew's Gospel tells us that it was their mother who came with the request they come to ask Jesus to do for us whatever we ask. And what do you want me to do, Jesus asked. 
Let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You can almost imagine Jesus just doing one of those. They were seeking honor and power and glory for themselves, completely misunderstanding what Jesus had, and I guess failing to hear, what Jesus had just said not that long before when he talked about how the first must be last and the, and the servant of all. They were not grasping the nature of Jesus' kingdom, which is not found in pomp and power, but in self-sacrificing service for others. Now, in his own gentle way, Jesus set them straight. You don't know what you were asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Jesus was talking about his sacrifice. When he would drink to the very last drop God's anger against sin on the cross. Would these disciples be able to endure that? Oh, we can, they answered. They were quick to answer. You will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. Well, James was the first apostle to be martyred. John was imprisoned, flogged, exiled. They followed their suffering master into suffering. Of course, not to the same extent as Jesus, but certainly because they were followers of Jesus. But the places that they were asking about, and Jesus' right and his left, well, Jesus really was, what Jesus talks about there is, is really what he says, I'm going to my Father's house to prepare a place for you. Those places are really what Jesus has prepared for all believers, not just for a select few, like John and James were imagining. Now, of course, the other ten disciples were upset with these two brothers. I mean, who wouldn't be, right? They were jealous. They also wanted those positions of power and importance. So again, Jesus has to set them straight, but in doing so, he lays before them the paradox of the Christian. You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Greatness is found in service. Glory is found in sacrifice for others. Often in the Bible, the some of the most important words are the smallest words. The word for in the very last verse tells us that really everything about the, the life and faith of a Christian starts with the fact that Jesus did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for all. That's where the paradox of the Christian begins. It begins with our eternal salvation. And that salvation itself is a paradox. We would expect that the Son of Man would be served. I mean, he's the King of kings and Lord of lords, right? Through him all things were created. He holds everything together with his power. And, and our society respects power. So wouldn't we expect the one who is almighty and all-powerful to have everybody else serving him? But the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. A little later, we're going to sing a hymn that proclaims this paradox. You, Lord, are both lamb and shepherd. 
You, Lord, are both prince and slave, clothed in light upon the mountain, stripped of might upon the cross, shining in eternal glory, beggared by a soldier's toss. You, the everlasting instant, you, are, you who are both gift and cost. So Jesus put aside his kingly, divine glory. The Son of God is also the Son of Man. And you see, in using that title, Jesus was identifying himself with us, with humanity, whom he had come to serve, to be sacrificed, to be that ransom price to set us free from slavery. And see, that's our problem, isn't it? We are, by nature, in slavery to sin, death, and hell. We have inherited the corrupt condition of Adam. And that condition still sticks to us, even as Christians. Like John and James. So often, we don't we want to push ourselves forward? We're, we're in slavery to, to selfishness. I want what I want and I want it now kind of idea. Or maybe that, that condition that slavery is seen in our stinginess. I mean, I'm the one who's earned what I have. Shouldn't I get to keep it for myself? Giving generous to others? I don't know about that. Or maybe it's evident in our lack of willingness to serve others. I mean, I've got my own problems to worry about. Helping somebody else? I don't, I don't have the time or energy for that. Or is this evident in the way we insist on our rights? I'm free. Free to do what I want. But actually, we're not free. We're enslaved by our sinfulness, which then means we're also enslaved by death and hell. Death is inevitable. No matter how hard we try, we can't escape that slavery. The life of the Son of Man, the Son of God, that's the price that sets us free. And that's the paradox, isn't it? I mean, it just doesn't seem fair, does it? That those who have gotten themselves into trouble should rely on someone else to get us out of trouble? Especially when he didn't get himself into trouble at all? That just doesn't compute. Why should Jesus, who is the perfect Holy Son of God, be the one paying the price to rescue us who are his enemies? But that is exactly what Jesus did. And that's why, because he is that perfect Son of God, his death is the payment to set us free. His holy, precious blood, his innocent sufferings and death, his death on the cross, he was carrying out God's great exchange. The Holy Son of God dying for unholy sinners. The perfect Son of Man sacrificed for sinful humanity, for sinful children of Adam like you and me. Peter wrote, Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. And to make the paradox even more amazing, consider how we receive the blessings of Jesus' sacrifice for us. Not through displays of power, not through some sort of extraordinary spirituality, 
or through strenuous efforts to be good. Rather, through a handful of water and the name of the triumph God. Through the good news of Jesus, read in a book or, or spoken by, by a sinful human being. Through a morsel of unleavened bread and a, and a sip of wine and the words of Jesus. Through these simple, ordinary things, God gives us extraordinary, spiritual, eternal blessings. He pours out on us forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation, which Jesus won for us when he poured out his own blood on the cross. What a beautiful paradox we see. He's releasing us from that slavery to sin, death, and hell. Setting us free. Free to live in heaven and on earth. See, that's the paradox of the Christian. It's where it continues. We've not been set free to do whatever we want. We've been set free to serve, or as Jesus put it, to be slaves of all. Now, this isn't natural for us to do, and I think especially as Americans. As Americans, we loathe slavery. As Americans, we, we follow the creed that we can do it ourselves if we just put our minds to it. We've, we've got these freedoms. And maybe the idea that God helps those who help themselves kind of thinking. But Jesus' death, is, his service to us, turns all that thinking upside down. See, that's what he was trying to get across to his disciples. It's not about being served. It's not about positions of importance and power. It's about serving others, being, as Jesus put it, slaves of all. That's why he gave us that, gave his life as a ransom, that, that we might be set free to do that, to serve others. And that's where our service is directed. It's directed to other people. Just think of the command, love your neighbor as yourself, right? And again, that, that's hard for us to do sometimes, to think about other people. But we have been set free to do just that. To think of how that might look in your family. Husband and wife sacrificing for each other. Children willingly obeying their parents. Parents caring for the spiritual and physical needs of their children. Brothers and sisters actually getting along well. Or think of what that might look like in our church. Volunteering in various ways. Maybe sending an encouraging note to a hurting member. Giving generous offerings to support the gospel's work. Think of what that might look like in our community. Maybe bringing a meal to sick neighbor, helping that co-worker who isn't always so nice to you, sharing the comfort of Jesus with a friend. Do you see the paradox? Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all going out of our way for others, serving those people in our lives, giving of ourselves for others, that's being first in God's sight. That's being great when it's done for the glory of God. In 1520, Martin Luther wrote a little book called The Freedom of the Christian. In that little writing, he 
presented two paradoxical statements, which are actually inscribed on the, Luther, the Martin Luther statue at Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary. A Christian is a perfectly free Lord, subject to none. A Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. What a beautiful way of stating that paradox. We are set free from everything that would enslave us. Sin, the law that, that wants to force us to have to obey, the power of death and the devil and hell. We have a place in heaven. But we've been set free also to serve others in love. You know, a lot of people in our world want to resolve paradoxes. They, they want to reason them out. The Christian, the paradox of the Christian cannot be reasoned out. It can only be believed and lived. Amen.